1914, you weren't a Canadian citizen. In 1914, you were either a British subject, you were a naturalized British subject, or you were unnaturalized. And it was the focus on these unnaturalized recent immigrants that was a concern for the Dominion government. Many of them now found themselves in Canada, not yet naturalized, and from countries that we are at war with. So not only were they alien to Canada, but they were now deemed enemy aliens. Internment was an operation, a uh, military operation, that was undertaken by the Government of Canada between the years 1914 and 1920. Essentially, some 8,579 so-called enemy aliens were interned in 24 camps across the country. These individuals were our homesteaders here in Canada, uh, and some of them, of course, were married, but most, most were uh, single, uh, single men. Approximately 3,500 of those men were actual Austro-Hungarian reservists or merchant marine. They estimate around 5,000 of those 5,500 were of e Ukrainian and the others were Eastern Europeans and, and a handful of, um, uh, from the Turkish em Ottoman Empire. It's here in Banff that during the First World War, there was actually a First World War internment camp. Not too many people know about this. The internment camp in Banff, which would be Castle Mountain and Caven Basin, opened up in uh, 1915 and closed two years later, 1917. The barracks for the Banff camp are located just beside the bathing pavilion here at Caven Basin, down on the tree line beside us here. And these were basic, simple buildings above ground, and there's essentially nothing left. It was a temporary, um, you know, they were temporary barracks um, built post on sill. There is a bit of terracing in and amongst the, the trees where the barracks were located, but a hundred years later the, the vegetation and trees have grown up and really obscured what was left. The statue is that of an internee. I mean, you know, we've taken archival photographs, you know, they, they wore a straw hat, they wore overalls, this is what they looked like. Um, the plaque itself is trilingual, it's English, French and Ukrainian. Briefly describing that there was an internment operations and that was the site of one of the 24 camps across Canada. The uh, statue and uh, bronze plaque were intentionally not placed at the campsite because there would be no artifacts left. And so um, from where the, the present statue and plaque, it's a 10-15 minute walk but you'd have to know where it was. The uh, statue and plaque that we unveiled in 1995 uh, serves many purposes, uh, in, in my view. One is to commemorate the, what happened in, in Canada during the First World War. It also serves as a reminder uh, what happens when people's civil liberties are, are taken away from them. Um, it also reminds Canadians that we don't have a, 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 a Christine pristine white uh, history where we're all happy people that came to Canada and everything was great. There was a lot of racism. I've, I've had people tell me that they, they, they can't believe this happened in Canada. They didn't know about it. They weren't taught about it in school. Um, I've also had people tell, tell me that sleeping dogs sh should continue sleeping and we should forget about this and move forward. And we should not think of the bad things that have happened in Canadian history. The uh, Castle Mountain site was tense. Uh, if you take a look at the archival uh, photographs, uh, the internees and the soldiers that uh, guarded them were, all lived in tents. And I've read stories where they say, well, you put 200 men in one big tent with two wooden stoves, it's, it's pretty cold. Um, and I don't think the soldiers fared much better for, for conditions. So I think everybody had a pretty rough time. Uh, they were supposed to receive um, a prisoner of war ration um, and which was so many calories per day but quite often they were unable to get that food and they were required to work. Um, there was one internee, his name was Nikolinik, who wrote to his family is that we're hungry, we're, we're cold, we're hungry and we're as hungry as dogs. So it was, it was pretty um, severe in, in some cases where people were um, not mistreated and beaten but they, they, they weren't fed and clothed uh, warm enough. For the two years that the internees were here, there are, still are some vestiges of their um, labor on the landscape. 
um, part of the road clearing that they did was on the 1A highway um, to Lake Louise. A few of the holes on the Bamp Springs golf course were cleared um, in, in preparation um, by the interns. So there's a bit, I mean, the, the park had been around for quite a few years before, but they definitely did contribute um, to what we enjoy today. Internment operations followed guidelines as, uh, as established under the uh, Hague Conventions, the 1899 Hague Conventions, which required ultimately that intern, uh, interning authorities pay these individuals as prisoners of war. Uh, so um, these individuals received a nominal wage of 25 cents a day, which was as equivalent to a, um, um, the wage of a, of a, of a soldier. Uh, um, and um, uh, they, uh, they received this nominal wage for one day's uh, worth of work. The, the, the families were left in very difficult situations. There was no support. Uh, there was actually scorn upon these families because they were enemy alien families. There is no evidence of anyone doing anything uh, that in any way, uh, shape or form uh, approximated sabotage or any of that nature. They, they had their wealth uh, taken away from them. They had their farms removed. Uh, they, what, they had their money out of their wallet taken away from them. Some of it was returned, some of it wasn't. They were just totally humiliated. Um, and they went back home to wherever they were. Some of them had family, some didn't, and they had to start again. We're here at uh, the Eaton interment site. The monument behind us was a memorial that was erected in 2005. Um, and it really sort of uh, is a symbolic gesture to honor the memory of those 86 individuals that were brought here in the early spring of 1919. Um, they were compelled to work on the, uh, on the railways, in effect fi fixing the, uh, uh, the railway beds, uh, putting in new ties. The camp existed for no more than 28 days. It was a very short-lived camp. So these individuals were sent to Amherst with the view that uh, they would eventually be deported. It's not clear uh, from the records as to uh, whether these individuals were in fact deported, although my suspicions are that they, in fact, a good percentage of them were. Uh, there's some 1,100 individuals who were in fact deported at the end of the war as uh, so-called undesirables. The majority of these individuals that were held in 1918 after hostilities were individuals identified in, by uh, internment authorities as malcontents, individuals in effect who had a, a gripe with you know, the government of Canada having spent some four years in an internment camp and they were not to be trusted and, and they continued to remain behind barbed wire with the idea that eventually they would be deported at, uh, with the signing of the peace treaty. These men were embarrassed. They were absolutely ashamed that this happened to them and many of these uh, men never spoke of it to their families. Um, and why I say that they never spoke is because, you know, in old age they would say I was interned and their families would disbelieve them because how could this happen in Canada? This is fundamentally a human rights story. Uh, the question of what we value most in this society, which is, uh, you know, our freedoms, our rights, our liberty. And uh, it behooves us to remember in a place like this, that in effect that this was taken away from people here in this place, which in effect values those very things. And so in some respects, what we need to always remember is uh, the fragility of human rights and that we need to be vigilant.